Louisiana's crops and livestock have always been under attack from invaders. More than a century ago, the Louisiana Agricultural Experiment Station started a defense system. Since then, researchers have developed successful technologies that impact people worldwide. Now, these soldiers of science are also helping fight cancer, destroy pests, and recapture coastland. They are Louisiana's front line of defense. It's easy to pick up food at the grocery store, but beyond that apparently routine scene lies an unperceived battlefield. Louisiana's wet climate promotes diverse plant and animal life, helping farmers produce food to eat and fiber for clothes and homes. But with abundant moisture also comes deadly attacks from invaders like weeds, disease, and insect pests. We talk about national security from a defense standpoint, but it's almost off our radar screen to think about not having food security. It, it's hard to overstate, I think, the benefit of agricultural research in order to feed the world. If it were not for that work that they do, we would have certainly been taken out by one of those threats some time ago. Over a century ago, national leaders drew up a tactical strategy to help farmers improve production of food and fiber. The Hatch Act of 1887 provided federal funds to help land-grant universities conduct agricultural research through state experiment stations. LSU started the Louisiana Agricultural Experiment Station. It has been the backbone of agricultural research in Louisiana for 125 years. And many of the results and knowledge that we've developed through our research has been important, I think, beyond the borders of, of Louisiana as well, to the nation and even to the international community. In 1972, the experiment station became the research arm of a newly created organization, the Louisiana State University Agricultural Center, or LSU Ag Center. With selected research strongholds throughout the state and departments on campus, the experiment station has worked closely with the Ag Center's other branch, the Louisiana Cooperative Extension Service. 85% of Louisiana is in agriculture, forestry, and aquaculture. The extension service and the research stations are the research and development arm of this $30 billion business. Agricultural research has typically meant helping produce better food and fiber, but it has also led to discoveries well beyond traditional applications. We were happy to see genetic bottlenecks showing population crashes with termite control programs. We were able to isolate bioactive uh, ceramide and then uh, tested it on uh, breast cancer cells and then found that cancer cells could not grow. Louisiana farmers uh, are faced with probably greater challenges in growing a crop than any other part of the United States. We have a diversity of crops that most other states don't have. That means it is very important for a state like Louisiana to have research stations that are scattered in strategically important parts of the state for the farmers that are growing in that region. This sugar kettle on Louisiana State University's campus belonged to Jean-Étienne de Boré. He used it to formulate the world's first granulated sugar at his New Orleans plantation. His breakthrough sparked a lucrative empire of white gold. It also marked the beginning of successful agricultural research in Louisiana. Really the first research station though it was not part of LSU at that time, was a sugar station, the Auburn Sugar Station in New Orleans. By the end of the 19th century, almost all of America's sugarcane was grown in Louisiana. 
Still, planters knew they needed scientific aid against formidable diseases. So, in 1885, they created a sugar experiment station. It operated in New Orleans at present-day Audubon Park. William Carter Stubbs was the first Louisiana Agricultural Experiment Station director, and he started the Audubon Sugar School at the Audubon Park site. His goal was to mold sons of planters into sugar industry experts. His students researched chemical problems that had limited crop yields. By the early 20th century, Stubbs' plan was working. Louisiana's sugar technology and profitability exceeded even the best sugar-producing countries in the world. The LSU campus is marked with solid reminders of great agricultural pioneers. One building is named for Stubbs, another for Charles Coates, director of the Audubon Sugar School for 40 years. He was also LSU's first football coach. Coates only coached one game, a dismal 34 to nothing loss to Tulane. But his success with applied chemistry was monumental. Coates taught what is believed to be the first chemical engineering class in America, which he integrated into the sugar school, along with mechanical engineering courses. For decades, the greatest sugar technology leaders in the world emerged from the sugar school. Both the Sugar Experiment Station and the Audubon Sugar School moved to the LSU campus in 1925. Uh, there was a, a, a research mill on uh, the campus there, not far from Tiger Stadium, that uh, carried on research to figure out how to extract more sugar from uh, the cane. When I came to LSU in 1961, the school was still operating at the time, and they were still bringing in cane. The train cars were still coming in, they were still hauling out the sugar, they were still hauling out the bag ass. And this occurred until about 1965 or so. The first official off-campus station was the North Louisiana Experiment Station, later called the Calhoun Research Station. Farmers had asked for scientific help with livestock and crops. At the invitation of American agricultural pioneer Seaman A. Knapp, Newly built railways had shuttled wheat farmers from the Midwest down to the southwestern prairies of Louisiana to farm rice. And at the beginning of the 20th century, the Louisiana rice boom was on. Disease, weeds, and insects began to lay siege to the new rice empire. So rice producers begged the Agricultural Experiment Station to start a rice research station in southwestern Louisiana. In 1909, one was started in Crowley. It was not only the first rice experiment station in America, but the first in the entire Western Hemisphere. The rice research station is the premier station probably in the world, not just in the country, but in the world. Some of the advances here in breeding has kept us farming. I mean, it, it literally, probably every 25 years the yields have doubled and that's the only way we could keep up with the rising cost of production. North Louisiana had become a cotton kingdom, but when Mexican boll weevils made their destructive march through the region, it left crops and communities devastated. As had happened in other parts of the state, farmers turned to the agricultural experiment station for help. Cotton growers donated money to open the Northeast Research Station at St. Joseph in 1929. Following World War II, skirmishes with weevils continued. But now, an army of cotton expertise would benefit the entire state as new research stations were deployed from east to west. Hill Farm in Homer, the Red River Station near Bossier City, and a little later, Dean Lee near Alexandria, and Macon Ridge, south of Winsboro. Together, these stations helped rescue the cotton industry. All of our research is, is, is built on research from one station to another. Is, they're, they're cumulative and they, they build on each other. Historically, Louisiana cotton entomologists have been some of the world's best. Entomology department head L.D. Newsom was a Boyd professor the most prestigious honor a researcher and educator can receive at LSU. 
Newsom made a huge national and international impact, helping create a new, streamlined insect control system that cut down on pesticides and benefited the environment. He also played a monumental national role in saving cotton from the infamous boll weevil. He did some very fundamental basic research in the 1950s on the boll weevil, trying to understand how it overwintered. And uh, through that, uh, that research, the, uh, a program called the diapause control program, which is what they go into a diapause or arrested state development during the winter. That it went in diapause and that was a weakness that they were able then to, to further investigate and it was the beginning of the boll weevil eradication program that took place in this country and I think that was a, very significant accomplishment. Don Labonte is a leading U.S. sweet potato breeder, and he's also director of the School of Plant, Environmental, and Soil Sciences at LSU. He owes some of his success to a predecessor he never met. Julian Creighton Miller was also head of what was then called the Department of Horticulture at LSU. The internationally acclaimed Miller was known for successfully breeding fruit and vegetable crops that were profitable all over America. But he had a special passion for the sweet potato. It had been a popular staple crop during the Great Depression era. Well, J.C. Miller, you know, really was that, that person that had this vision that sweet potatoes was just a, an enormously important crop and it needed to go somewhere. The heart of his research was, was getting that breeding program established in sweet potatoes. No one had figured out how to do that, and he was the first one to do this. Miller was the first person in the continental U.S. to cause the sweet potato plant to bloom and set seed. He developed a breeding program that produced some of the best sweet potatoes in America and captured the attention of researchers all over the world. Miller's success laid the groundwork for the nation's only land-grant facility devoted solely to sweet potato science, the Sweet Potato Research Station in Chase. The impact of our sweet potato breeding program uh, at the LSU Ag Center Sweet Potato Research Station cannot be overstated. Uh, that program has positively affected producer operations not only in Louisiana, but also across the United States and around the world. Were it not for the sweet potato station at Chase, we wouldn't be in business here. A reason for those victories has been the experiment station's continual development of tough, higher yielding varieties of crops like sugarcane, cotton, and rice. But scientists have to constantly create new ones. Relentless waves of disease, weeds, and insects eventually adapt and can wipe out plants that once seemed indestructible. Entomologists, uh, weed scientists, for example, plant pathologists, agronomists are all Im vitally important in this mix of bringing a new variety to the actual stage of production in the state. Steve Linscombe is one of the top rice breeders in the world, and he orchestrates maybe the best rice research operation on the planet. Rice is a major food source for people worldwide, so improving the harvest can save tens of thousands of lives. On the flip side, red rice is a weed that has devastated rice crops and dwindled food supplies. Because it is a relative of rice, uh, it was basically impossible to develop a conventional herbicide that would kill red rice without harming the commercial crop. After radiating and mutating tens of thousands of rice seeds, researchers at the rice station discovered something dramatic. It was the world's first herbicide-resistant variety, a kind of anti-red rice innovation that cleared out the weeds. They called it Clearfield, and it has revolutionized rice production. We can now actually plant a rice field, spray a herbicide, and kill weedy red rice. And just to give you an idea of how important this is, this year, probably over 70% of the rice in the southern U.S. will be planted to clear field varieties. This probably kept us in business again because red rice was about to wipe out uh, rice production in southwest Louisiana. These rices are called clear field rices and they are used by rice farmers all over the, the world. And that is certainly a milestone in the history of weed control in, in rice. 
In the late 1980s, disease and pests had dismantled sweet potato crops. The once vibrant industry was crumbling. That's when LSU Ag Center researchers developed a sweet potato variety named for a Louisiana general. The Beauregard, like its namesake, PGT Beauregard, would for a time engineer amazing victories against multiple attacks. Dr. Ralston, Larry Ralston, who was an entomologist, had an interest in incorporating insect resistance into our uh, breeding lines. It was, kind of a, it was kind of an interesting thing that he was not a sweet potato breeder, but he collected the seed, made the selections, and when he saw Beauregard in his seedlings, he recognized that he had something special. The seedling 82508 moved through the breeding program and was released as a variety in five years, which is almost unheard of because it normally takes eight, nine, ten years. When it first came out, it was such a beautiful potato and the taste was just phenomenal. And to the effect that uh, Louisiana, we took much of the market in the United States and uh, the other states were trying to figure out how to grow this Beauregard. It, it just absolutely brought new life to the sweet potato industry in the same, and, and pretty much saved it. Beauregard was America's leading variety for 20 years. It's still grown globally and the station has continued to produce superior varieties that help resist ever-present enemies. For over a century, there were very few sugarcane varieties in Louisiana. The lack of diversity invited an array of assaults. But in the late 19-teens, early 1920s, sugarcane diseases really began to catch up with that. There was no ongoing breeding and variety development effort. Researchers actually had to uh, travel to Southeast Asia and, and uh, collect uh, wild canes and uh, actually pack them back here in suitcases. Those worked for a short while, then succumbed. So the Louisiana Sugar Station began breeding and raising new canes varieties resistant to disease and insects. One in particular, 384, would stand as a towering battlement, changing the sugarcane landscape forever. When 384 was coming through the program, I can remember it was grown in a second line trial plot across the street. And you know, you didn't need statistics to tell you that this was a significantly better variety than anything out there. So we improved cold tolerance, we improved our sucrose content, our tonnage. It was almost a situation that was too good to be true. The variety that we became 384 was such a prodigious yielder that it required a different harvesting system that could pick up downed cane and cut it into billets and uh, feed it to the mills in, in that shape. And it enhanced the efficiency of harvest and it really made our farmers much more competitive than they had been in the past. Disease adapted to the variety and the variety became susceptible. But not only do you have the legacy of 384 as a commercial variety, it's a good parent and it really has pushed the next generation of varieties. Sugar doesn't just appear. The quest for good varieties starts with a step Dr. St. John Chilton invented. Now it's up to researchers to help sustain a billion dollar industry. Chilton was the first to show that you could uh, induce sugarcane to flower and we're still utilizing that research. That work was done in the 1950s. Sugarcane does not flower naturally in Louisiana, so we have to uh, put them on these photo period carts. We have to push them in after dark and take them out in the morning at a prescribed time. It takes 13 years for us to make that cross in the crossing house and hopefully at the end of that process, get a variety that we can release to the uh, farmers. There would likely not be a Louisiana sugar industry. It's just that important to, to keep those scientists developing varieties, developing means of disease control, and, and, and all the other factors uh, that, that keep us in business. World-renowned veterinary scientist William Haddock Dalrymple arrived from Scotland in 1889 to become director of the LSU Veterinary Science Department. He was the first veterinarian ever at the Agricultural Experiment Station and is considered the father of veterinary science in Louisiana. Dalrymple's pioneering work was battling livestock disease. Dalrymple was 
was probably one of the most important figures in organized veterinary medicine in the United States. Prior to the 1880s and 90s, there wasn't a lot of official animal disease research going on. And so the, the greatest milestone is the fact that he just set up a functioning diagnostic laboratory from scratch and was able to make it work. Building upon Dalrymple's iconic legacy, modern-day experiment station scientists have solved disease problems too, like creating the first and only U.S. vaccine for anaplasmosis, a blood-borne disease that can kill cattle. And then there were efforts to combat the enemy, brucellosis. Brucellosis is a disease of cattle that uh, causes late-term abortion. And so from an economic standpoint, it's, it can be very devastating in, in a herd. The current vaccine that's used in the United States is RB51. And this is the first place where we actually use the vaccine in cattle here at LSU. And it worked. And it is now the vaccine, the official USDA vaccine for brucellosis in the U.S. Mysteriously, Louisiana marshland cattle were constantly being infected with brucellosis. To make matters worse, most of the state's beef cattle at the time were located in those marsh areas. So we ended up coming up with a system to change the way the vaccine was being used. So in about uh, a four year, five year period of time, we went from over 50% of the herds infected to virtually none. They're free now, of course. It, it played an important part in Louisiana becoming brucellosis free. If it weren't, uh, it's been estimated that it would cost us 20 to 30 million dollars in loss. Despite poor soil, Claiborne Parish in the 30s had more acreage of cotton than any parish or county in America. But cotton faded away there, and by the 50s, the Hill Farm Research Station had turned its focus to cattle, forage, and forestry. The site became a leader in forestry management, helping develop a profitable and renewable timber industry that would become the state's leading cash crop. No place in Louisiana has done more forestry research in the last 60 years than the Hill Farm. By 1960, dairy farms were thriving in the region, but a disease called mastitis began to plunder profits. A battery of Hill Farm researchers worked on a line of defense. It's a disease of the udder of cattle, and it is characterized primarily by uh, microbial, bacterial infections of uh, the mammary gland, the milk-producing tissues of the udder, and that is manifested then in terms of what is co of consequence to the dairy farmer is a reduction in the total amount of milk being produced. At the experiment station, they did a tremendous amount of work in dealing with mastitis, uh, prevention and curing and, and all of the techniques that you needed to try to prevent that from becoming a huge problem within your herd. We determined that we have probably invested about $20 million over 45 years in the mastitis research program at this station, but it has probably returned more than $1 billion to dairy farmers around the world. That's a return of $500 for every $1 invested. The Iberia Research Station has a long history of developing quality cattle. Previously, the station had been a USDA operation. The site was the birthplace of Brangus cattle, a high-quality crossbreed of Brahmins and Angus. The Brahmin breed is just a very important uh, to have as a, as, a, uh, as a part of a crossbreeding program. Uh, many years ago it was learned that uh, purebred animals uh, did not perform as well as crossbred animals. And this has allowed our beef producers to do a much better job of, of uh, having animals that have some of the resistance to the heat and the insects that tropical cattle need, but still have some of the positive varieties of meat tenderness and growth traits that the more northern breeds bring to us. The Reproductive Biology Center is recognized as a world leader in assisted reproductive technologies for improving the quality of livestock. 
Among many other world firsts, these researchers were able to use frozen beef bull semen from the 60s, the oldest on record, to successfully produce live calves. We have a Boyd professor by the name of Dr. Robert Godke that I think has, has certainly made an uh, outstanding contribution over time in the area of, uh, of embryo transfer in animal agriculture. When a Louisiana hunter sees a giant buck, he knows he's in sportsman's paradise. The Bob R. Jones Idlewild Experiment Station has helped make those dreams come true by bolstering healthy deer herds statewide. It's one of the only captive deer research sites in the country. Most of the work up here uh, revolves around either uh, research on disease control, especially on whitetails, which is the biggest limiting factor here in the state and in the South, and also on reproductive work. Since frozen cattle semen had already been used to produce calves, Sanders asked a reproductive biologist if the same could be done with dead trophy bucks. But I asked him, could you do that with deer? He said, we don't know, because a lot of the really good deer are taken uh, fair chase by hunters, or what, you know, then you lose all that genetic material. Researchers at the Reproductive Biology Center did successfully produce the world's first white tail fawn from frozen buck sperm. Ultimately, researchers are preserving superior deer genetics, making sportsmen's paradise even better. Louisiana is a garden of Eden for plant diseases. A fungicide might rid fields of one disease, then another attacks. That's where pathologists come in. They're scientists who diagnose disease and then find solutions. Plant pathologist Ray Schneider could be considered a type of Paul Revere to soybean growers. Schneider's sentinel signal to America was, the rust is coming. Asian soybean rust is a devastating disease that had struck every major soybean producing country in the world, except America. We were on the lookout for it at that time, and in November of that year, November 6th of 2004, I had a visitor with me from, uh, from Illinois. I asked him if he wanted to come out and look at some diseases he probably didn't see in Illinois. He began to notice that I was looking a little more concerned than normal. And so he asked me, is that soybean rust? So uh, I said, very likely, but you can't tell anybody. Federal agencies descended upon the LSU Ag Center campus because soybean rust was on a list of high alert diseases. These are diseases that could be introduced as, as weapons of bioterrorism, for instance, or pathogens that could be introduced that would have a devastating impact on one of the major crops in the United States. Soybean rust was at the top of that list. While our producers have not experienced those levels of disease losses, it is because of the fungicide work that we did here uh, and elsewhere around the country. But they've learned to control the disease and it's now a disease that is relatively easy to manage provided it's detected early. Asian rust attacks by air, parachuting in as tiny spores. Schneider's team developed the first spore trap of its kind for detecting the disease. The patented invention was so successful, now it's also being used by grape vineyards in California.